Thank you, Charlie. Thank you all that are giving me feedback. Raj. Welcome to our first in a series of webinars from Award Solutions. As I said, my name is Chris Reese. I am technologist at Award Solution. And I have been with Award Solutions for a little over 18 years. I uh, co-lead our practice on automation and insights. I focus on the artificial intelligence, machine learning piece of that. If you're not familiar with Award Solutions, and I recognize some of the names, I think I have ran into you sometime over the last few years. Award Solution is a um, proven leader in technology training. We have been focused on the wireless space for most of our 22-year career as a company. Uh, we also focus on other aspects that support the telecom industry, things like automation and artificial intelligence. Some of the concepts that we do training about are things like uh, data visualization, Python, Ansible, data insights, and such. We also focus a lot on 5G and IoT today. I would like to first off thank all of you for attending today. And um, I want to give you an extra special thanks for those of you who are attending the webinar today. We have a gift. And our gift is if you um, go to our website, and I will actually send this link out. If for anybody who connects with me in LinkedIn, I will send you this code so you don't have to write it all down. But for anybody who is interested, we have um, a bundle of training. We have a Welcome to Artificial Intelligence, which is an on demand course, self paced, one hour overview. Take it whenever you want. And with that, we also have something we refer to as a technology primer. And the technology primer, is a four hour live session with a, a live instructor. And we have a couple of dates on our calendar right now, September 11th and October 14th. You sign up for either of those. If you sign up as a bundle, you automatically get a 20% discount. Because you're attending today, you get an extra 20% off. Connect with me on LinkedIn and I'll send you the details. Now let's get to the key stuff that we want to talk about. What I want to focus on today is AI use cases predominantly within the telecom industry. And we're going to focus on this in three basic categories. We're going to talk about AI use cases in general, what makes a good AI use case. We're going to talk about some AI use cases that are directly um, within the telecom industry. And then lastly, we're going to have something I refer to as telecom impacting use cases. And what I mean by telecom impacting use cases is there are a number of use cases that, though aren't really a telecom use case, they are a use case that's going to end up impacting the telecom industry. And so we'll talk about a couple of examples of that as we move forward. Now, one of the things that I like to do when I do any type of presentation is because artificial intelligence is a very fast moving industry. So I'm going to pull up a couple of articles that have come out over the last few days. I'll send you the link to the article in the chat. You can save that when we're done today so that you can have all those articles if you'd like to read them after the fact. At any point, please jump into the chat and ask questions. And I will do my best to answer them as we're going along. At the end of our time together, we will have also another opportunity for a question and answer as well. All of that being said, let's start off with a discussion of generic, in general, AI use cases. Now, the way I like to start this off is this is something that, that helps me understand kind of the role that AI plays within everything. 
And so I refer to this as the AI and automation life cycle. So let me spend a couple of minutes and walk through this slide. Now, before I even get into this, we're not gonna talk about it today, but really what we're gonna focus on is machine learning. Artificial intelligence can be thought of as, as being composed of something called a rules-based approach, which is a older approach, or it can be a machine learning based approach. Really, we're using the machine learning based approach. And the example that I'm giving here is a very machine learning um, approach to doing artificial intelligence. And as the name implies, with machine learning, we're learning something. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about what it means to learn something. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to focus on we need data. The most important thing that we have as part of doing any type of machine learning, artificial intelligence um, model creation is we need data. We need valuable data. We need accurate data. We need data that's representative, representative of the sample set that we're trying to do some type of a prediction about. As a matter of fact, I just saw this morning, and I'll, I'll post the link to this here in a few minutes. There was a article that um, I found, an infographic, a really great infographic on the ethics of AI. And one of the examples that they gave in that was uh, Amazon a number of years ago was using artificial intelligence to filter job candidates. So what it did is it used um, a number of resumes of good candidates. And it was trying to teach this algorithm how to look at a resume and determine if it was good or not. Well, inadvertently, what ended up happening is at that time, mainly men were applying for the job. So the end result was it concluded that you needed to be a man to be a good candidate for this position, which is obviously not the case. But my point is, is we need good representative data. And this is probably 80 to 90% of the problem that we have. If we don't have good data, we're not gonna get a good algorithm. Two, we then need to do some kind of model creation. And as part of this model creation, we're going to do training. And what we mean by training is we're going to learn how to make a prediction based off of data. My favorite example of this is a very, very simplistic example of um, if I were to want to teach an algorithm the difference between a dog and a cat. Well, I would need a whole bunch of pictures of dogs and a whole bunch of pictures of cats and then I could train an algorithm to tell the difference between a dog and a cat. And then I give it a new picture and it would be able to determine was that a dog or was that a cat? That's the training mode. I'm taking this data and trying to learn how to do some kind type of a prediction. This is going to take a lot of time. It's this training portion that is the very difficult portion of the AI process. Now, once we have trained it, we then need to de deploy the model. And what I mean by this is this is something where we're going to use the model to do a new prediction. And so in the case of my dog versus cat, I would give it a new picture and it would tell me, is that a dog or is that a cat? Another example that you're probably a little bit more familiar with would be something like the smartphone app, the camera app on your smartphone, where the box forms around someone's face. Well, that's an AI algorithm. It's been trained to identify what a face is and put a box around it. Now, why is it putting the box around that face? That's what it's using as part of its autofocus. 
we're not really as worried about the autofocus piece in this in this example, but it's a good a good um, easy thing for us to get our mind wrapped around. Okay, so we start with data. We take data. We do some type of model creation and training. We then deploy that model to where it can be used, and we'll get into this model deployment in more examples here in a little bit. And then lastly, we need to do something. We need to take some action. Now, in a perfect world, it's an automated action. And as we think about things from the telecom space, that automated action ends up being a really important thing. The more that we can automate and have the machine take the action on its own, the better. But we may have some human intervention that's needed. And as I work with service providers around the world, one of the things I'll tell them is I'll say, really one of the key issues I want you to walk away with is the, um, you have more and more work you have to do year over year after year. As I look at something like 5G, 5G is going to bring more and more cell sites to the picture. Well, I'm not gonna hire um, enough staff to maintain all of those cell sites. I need to do something to bridge that gap. And that's where artificial intelligence can come in. So if all I do is use artificial intelligence to deal with my boring, rudimentary things with automation, awesome. And I can leave the human being to uh, focus on the things that we really need the human being to focus on. So here's a very simple high-level view of an AI and automation life cycle. Okay, so that being said, let's take a look at kind of a high-level example. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Oh, actually, I don't have it here. We're going to go here. So, um, so let's kind of focus on this from a telecom perspective. So this is a little bit of an older example of different use cases, and that's what I want you to think about this, different use cases, and how this relates to the telecom space. As Gartner likes to refer to, um, the telecom industry is a communication service provider or a CSP. And you can see on the kind of the x-axis here, as we move towards the right, the number of opportunities, and as we get higher on the scale, the more it relates to the communication service provider. Now, when we talk about AI, and we're actually gonna look at a couple of examples, and we've talked about some basic examples of things like image recognition. Eh, I don't think that we're gonna do a lot of that in the telecom industry. Um, maybe a little, but I don't think we're gonna do a lot. Um, emotion detection, eh, maybe we'll do a little bit of that, um, and we'll talk a little bit about where we might use that, but in general, what we're going to see things are going to be more of um, using intelligence at the edge. This is one of the ones we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about. We might do some speech analytics, we might do some deep learning, but really starting to push some of the the intelligence to the edge is a, a big, big point. So if we think about kind of AI in general, there's a couple of, of kind of background concepts that I think are really good. We've been using these for quite a while, and one of them is called bots. And we think about bots, there's two different basic types of bots that we, we use in the industry. One's called a chat bot, and I'm sure you've interacted with a chat bot at least once in your life. A chatbot is coming in and it's it's acting like a human being and responding sometimes via text, sometimes via audio. As a matter of fact, I think there is, and I haven't been able to prove this yet, um, I got a, a, a telemarketer call recently. And the way it sounded to me is that it was a pre-recorded thing. It was in essence a chatbot but it was responding, it, and at times would ask me questions, and it was waiting for me to respond, and then it would take and you know make a different decision 
based off of my response because I actually went in there and say, are you a robot? And it didn't respond to me. And so that would be a more sophisticated example of a chatbot, but we're used to, to chatbots. Another example is something called robotic process automation or RPA. And RPA is a very interesting automation technique that allows us to start to kind of emulate human behavior, at least within software. And I'll talk about what that means here in a second. So let's talk about the chatbot. So you might think, well, what's so interesting about a chatbot? We've been using these for quite a while. Why is it an artificial intelligence thing? Well, what a chatbot is doing is it's using a specific aspect of artificial intelligence called natural language processing or NLP. Now, what's interesting about NLP is human speech is really hard to teach a computer how to decipher. If you've ever played any of those text-based games from the 80s or the 70s where you were typing in responses, open door, you know, I remember um, playing one of these games with some friends of mine, and we couldn't figure out how to phrase the statement that we wanted to make using the words that the algorithm understood because it had a very, 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 very limited vocabulary. But now we want to be able to do things that's more of a natural English speaking approach. And that's where natural language processing comes in, is it's learning how to not just take each individual word and kind of string them together, but where does a word fit in context? I was listening to a podcast recently, and one of the examples they gave for natural language processing was the word bridge. And if I'm remembering it correctly, the word bridge had like 13 different meanings depending on context. There was bridge as a noun, it could be a physical bridge, it could be more of a metaphorical bridge, right? So bridge over a river, a bridge between two people who are having some type of difficulties. It can be used as a verb, it can be used as a noun. So there's many different contexts for this word bridge. So if I were to include that within a chat bot, then it needs to understand the context that we're dealing with. So a simple example of a chatbot using natural language processing. Now, natural language processing is more than just a chatbot. It's anytime we're trying to, to, to analyze text and come up with some meaning. Now, maybe this is some type of a relationship extraction. Um, named entity recognition. So one of the tutorials I went through when I was learning about chatbots was I wanted to create a chatbot that um, understood if I said, um, what's the weather in Boston? Well, it understood what it mean it understood what the it understands what the word weather means. Typically when we say what's the weather, we mean things like temperature, is it raining, is it sunny, that kind of thing. And then Boston would be an example of a named entity recognition. So we know Boston is significant. It represents a specific city that has a very specific geographical location. Maybe you want to do things like an automatic text summarization. We see that in the, the legal space becoming more and more interesting. Sentiment analysis. Um, is somebody angry? What is their feeling about things? We see this pop up a lot in uh, customer service calls within the telecom space. I heard an example at one point where if all I did was have a AI algorithm listening to a customer service call, and when it detected that the customer was getting upset, pulled a manager in. So the manager could come in, the supervisor could come in and preempt any type of problem. 
parts of speech tagging, as well as extracting any key topics that might be there. I had the opportunity of mentoring a high school student last year who, as part of an independent study, wrote a text summarization algorithm. And basically, what it did is it went through and analyzed a large group of text, and it found the, the key sentences that represented the key theme of that, um, in this case, a Wikipedia page. So very interesting stuff, very interesting stuff. Another key aspect of um, artificial intelligence, so we've talked a little bit about um, natural language processing. Image recognition is another one. This is something that's a solved problem. We've been doing image recognition within machine learning for a number of years. You can download a application, um, from GitHub that allows you to hold up objects in front of your webcam until it'll tell you what those objects are. So image recognition is a very big thing. How are we using this in the telecom space? A couple of examples that I've seen is, and a lot of times it has to do with drone footage. So people are using drones to take pictures or to take a video of cell sites and, and then using image recognition to say, how, are there any problems with those cell sites? Do I have a bad cable? Do I have a, um, an antenna pointed in the wrong direction or what have you? So let's take everything that we've talked about so far and let's apply this in a very simplistic high-level telecom example. So I'm gonna need some type of data. In this case, we're gonna look at network data. One of the great things about the telecom industry is we have a lot of data. Maybe that is called detail records, maybe that is counters that are coming from various pieces of equipment, maybe it's logs, maybe it's some type of a network trace, we have a ton of data. And one of the problems in the telecom industry today is we have so much data that we're not even taking a look at. And the main reason we're not taking a look at it is time. I don't have time to analyze all of the data coming from all of the pieces of equipment. But if I can teach a computer how to do it for me, that might give me something very powerful. So I've got a lot of network data. One more thing about the network data. Um, one of the big challenges within the AI industry today is for me to write an algorithm, I need to have access to that data. A lot of the data that we have in the telecom space is proprietary data. It's, it's privileged data. So we don't have the luxury of um, sharing that. So therefore, we need to, to be able to do, to develop some of these algorithms uh, internally that can use all of this data. I take the data, I build a model and I train it to do whatever it is I want it to, to train. I want to be able to identify a, um, a problem. I want it to be able to identify a, a, a potential problem. We deploy the model and then we take action. And let's just say for the sake of argument, the first time we build this, the first thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to, to get to where we can just automate 20% of our actions. 80% we still need human beings involved. Great, fantastic. What we might do is we might send, as we've learned how to do this, we might um, retrain our model based off of what we're learning and then instead of it being 20 and 80, maybe it's going to be 30%, 70%. Maybe over time, we'll get 80% that's automated and only 20% that we need human beings involved. That would be a very, very powerful tool. A very, very powerful tool. All right. 
Cool. I'm going to pause for a second. Um, questions, comments, thoughts at this point? Jump into the chat and just let me know what you're thinking if you've got any questions or comments or thoughts. All right. Awesome. So as we transition to start focusing on artificial intelligence within the telecom space, there are um, a couple of ways. Oh, is there a, um, see, I think we have a question coming from, um, how are AI and ML related? We have as a question. That is a fantastic question. Um, so let me, go over here and let me address the AI and ML question. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures to draw with respect to this. So we can, we can think of this as representing everything that is artificial intelligence. And um, I love um, the history of artificial intelligence. And this comes from these old science fiction books and Isaac Asimov is, is really considered the grandfather of artificial intelligence from the 40s. We're not doing a lot of that artificial intelligence stuff. We're, we're definitely not having to worry about as uh, Isaac Asimov portrays in Caves of Steel, which is the, the first of the robot series books, um, about a world in which a robot can impersonate a human being. We're not there yet. What we're really focused on is something called narrow AI. And narrow AI is where we're solving a specific problem using artificial intelligence. There's two basic approaches that people are using for this. Something called a rules-based approach or a machine learning-based approach. The, the, the rules-based approach is an older approach. It's um, we saw a lot of, of movement in that space in the 90s. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, um, Deep Blue, or I'm sorry, Big Blue, uh, the IBM computer that beat Gary Kasparov two games out of three at chess in the late 90s, that was a rules based. And so that was very if then based. That's what we mean by rules. So you have to have an exhaustive understanding of the domain to be able to program that. What we see today is more of a machine learning based approach, which we've already talked a little bit about. In practice, and I think uh, uh, SS, this is what's going to the, the heart of the question that you're asking, is in practice today, we use the terms machine learning and artificial intelligence interchangeably. Really, if we want to be technically correct, we should call it just machine learning. Now, we haven't talked about this, but let me go ahead and, and add one more concept to this uh, picture I'm drawing, is as a subcomponent of machine learning, we have something called deep learning. And really all that I care about is it's a more complicated machine learning. It's, it's clearly a subset of machine learning. We don't focus on deep learning as a separate thing, but it is um, a, a subset of the machine learning space. So 95 plus percent of the time, machine learning and artificial intelligence can be interchanged, except in some very, very rare cases. So that's a great question, SS. Uh, Raj is asking a question. Is AI going to replace SON self-optimizing, or is it optimizing, organized, self-organizing networks, which is a feature that we see, we, we originally saw that introduced as part of LTE, long-term evolution, fourth generation wireless, and we're seeing that concept extended into 5G. 
And Raj, the, the, the great question. What I want you to think about with respect to SON is think about SON in this way. I've got a network that's got, and I'll use my little triangles here representing base stations. I've got to do some type of communication between these base stations to share some information. That's what's doing the, the, the organization, the optimization of this network. But there also is kind of underlying all of this some type of um, decision making. There's logic that's coming in. So we can think of this logic as being AI. So I might use AI as part of my SON algorithms. Uh, kind of in the same way, is AI going to replace photography? Well, no, it's not going to replace photography, but I might use artificial intelligence to enhance my photography in some way. The uh, face identification that we talked about a few minutes ago might be an example of that. So that's how those two things might relate. All right, excellent. Um, question from Sam K. What is a good beginner software package to deploy AI? Um, it's a good question. And the there's a couple of approaches that we could take with respect to um, AI software packages. We could um, we could take um, something like a Python based approach, so more of a programming approach. And there's a couple of um, libraries that Python has, people have built for Python. Um, one is called Keras, and another is called TensorFlow. TensorFlow. And if you do any type of a search on Keras um, TensorFlow, you can find gobs of tutorials on that. So there's kind of the programming approach that we could take. The other approach we could take is more of an integrated package. And what I mean by that is these are typically more GUI based. They're more drag and drop based. And so Azure has a machine learning studio, uh, AWS, has one. Um, there's a company called Deep Cognition that has a GUI based approach. So these are a number of different um, companies that are trying to simplify um, the software, simplify how you build the model. But I think what, what you're getting at, uh, Sam, is more of what I have on the left hand side of this screen. Um, and so oh, SS has a follow-up question. He says, so um, AI was present in 4G also with SON features. I don't want to give you that impression, um, SS. Um, we'll go back to the SON for a second. AI could be used here. What I really want to, to highlight is the fact that SON is more about communication not so much the logic behind what to communicate and when. And that's typically a good way of thinking about anything that comes out of the standards committees. What the standards committees are doing is they're trying to define communication mechanisms. They're not really trying to define uh, all of the logic behind it. So could someone build AI into SON? Yes. Has that happened in general? I only know of a couple of very simplistic examples, and I would say that that's a very baby version of that. But don't think SON equals AI, but think that AI can enhance SON and make SON better. All right, excellent. Great questions. Okay. 
What I'd like to do now is I'd like to move forward and talk a little bit about um, a number of different use cases. And what I have on the screen is a fairly old um, slide. And again, it's, it's interesting in my mind that as we talk about something like artificial intelligence, which most of us probably didn't even think about before the last couple of years, a slide that's two years old is considered old. I find that very interesting personally. So um, what this slide is really trying to focus on is for the communication service provider market, what are some use cases that we have and what is the, the value that that use case might bring? So let me give you a, a, a bad example just to, to kind of set the stage. We've been doing billing within the telecom industry for 120 years. Artificial intelligence isn't going to make billing any better. We know how to do that. We're billing, or I'm sorry, where artificial intelligence is going to help us out is the stuff that's more on the right-hand side of this slide. So, for example, we see a lot of discussions within the fraud management space. We see a lot of discussions within the security space. Um, I spent the first nine years of my career doing network planning and engineering. And so a lot of great examples where we might use artificial intelligence in that space. And you can see a number of different examples here. So let me kind of walk through some of the examples that I have. I'll walk through these kind of, of quickly. Uh, field services. So you might think on the surface that seems kind of weird. Um, how is it that artificial intelligence can help me out in the field because I need to go to the field? So really when we talk about field services, what we're getting at is workforce optimization. Let me pick a better color. In workforce optimization, what we mean is the scheduling of our workforce. How are we making the decision of who goes where and when? So if I can develop an algorithm that helps me automatically deploy people to the field that can optimize how I'm using those people. So one example that I saw is uh, they had as, as an objective, 10% of emergency field service work being triaged and scheduled by artificial intelligence. So you could imagine I call in um, saying I've got some type of a problem, the artificial intelligence is listening to me explain the problem, and then it turns around and sends somebody to my house without a human being making the decision. The AI is making the decision. Finance. A, a lot of great things within finance um, right now. I just saw an article uh, today that says that people are using old reports and having AI algorithms analyze it and seeing if they can come up with new insights in some of the data that they've had. So finance and being able to decide how we're going to do things. Network assurance is one of my favorite ones to talk about because one of the biggest challenges of a um, communication service provider today is how do I make sure that my network stays up and running? Yeah, we've got planning issues, and we'll talk about those in a second. But if I ever have an outage, if I ever have a problem, then I've really got an issue. Here within the United States, there are a lot of issues that if you have this as a service provider, you have to tell the Federal Communication Commission, the FCC, that you've had that problem. And I'm sure in other countries where you are, there's a similar type of a, a law. And so one of uh, my biggest challenges as a communication service provider is to minimize the number of times I have a conversation with the, the federal entity that's managing communication. So if I can start doing predictive things, to say, hey, this is a problem that might happen, so let's change this piece of equipment, let's automatically make a change to the network, that's gonna solve some of those problems. 
here within the United States, there was a, a commercial a number of years ago where a guy walks up to a home, knocks on the door, and it's a repairman. And the lady opens the door and she says, can I help you? And the guy says, your refrigerator is uh, broken. And she goes, it's not broken, but it will be. I'm here to repair it. So basically, he, the refrigerator in this commercial had told somebody or someone made the decision that this refrigerator was about to have a problem. And it responded and we sent a technician out. So kind of a network assurance type of a mentality. Security and fraud management. This is another really interesting area that is being used for artificial intelligence. Can we identify fraud? Can we identify some type of a security breach? And every day there is um, some type of a security breach that, that is announced. And if I can use artificial intelligence to manage that and to, to help me in some way, all the better. Let me pause for a second. There's something I want to show you. So one of the things that I do is I have set up a Google alert for artificial intelligence, just AI. And what this does is it sends me an email every day of um, any article that is shown up that has AI um, in the title or, or anything in the in the uh, in the description. And so one of the things I wanted you to see is not this one, not this one, this one. I'm gonna post this in the chat. If you want to keep it, you can you can keep it is can AI think eth um, um, ethically? And it's a really interesting article. I'm not necessarily advocating. I don't necessarily agree with everything that uh, it says, but it's definitely a very well done thing talking about some of the challenges. And so when you start talking about things like security, um, this is one of the things that always pops up here. Um, question came up earlier about Python, reasons why Python is good for AI and ML. We talked about software. Let me, let me send you this. And this is an article that came out yesterday that was focused on um, different technologies and how, and how they can use AI and how Python can be used to um, implement that. And this chart, I'm going to make a copy of this so I can I can kind of draw on it. I find this chart very interesting. It uses terms that are not commonly used in the in the industry, but let's see there it is. So, but I like kind of the way that it thinks about things. And I think this kind of helps us when we're talking thinking about use cases for AI. So, for example, it's defining something called a assisted intelligence, augmented intelligence, or autonomous intelligence. And the example that I like the most is this middle example, where it's saying um, assisted intelligence, well, that may be something like cruise control in your car. My wife's car has a adaptive cruise control so that if you get too close to the car in front of you, it automatically slows down. So that would be an, an example of assisted intelligence. Augmented intelligence could be something like lane detection system. My mother-in-law's car has the ability to, when you get over towards the edge of the lane, it will automatically steer you back into the middle of the lane. And so I, was, I accidentally turned that on when I was driving her car a few days ago, and I was fighting it. I kept, I kept pushing me in a direction I didn't want to go and I couldn't figure out why. And then lastly, a self-driving car would be um, autonomous intelligence. So if we think about this kind of model within the telecom space, we might have something that is augmenting our intelligence, telling us which 
base station we should look at first. Augmented intelligence may be actually even telling us what the problem is, and then autonomous intelligence might solve the problem on its own. But I thought that was an interesting article, and so I've posted that in there as well. Um, I think those were the biggies. But I just wanted to also point out this, this uh, Google alert, setting this up to learn more about kind of what's happening in the industry. I kind of skimmed this. It sends you three, the, the uh, top three articles every day. It's kind of an interesting thing. Okay. But we get into security. There was another article I found. I thought I had it there, but I didn't. Um, people are trying to use AI to detect issues within the security and fraud management space. So this is kind of the way I like to think about this. Um, if you go back a few years, if I ever traveled internationally and I tried to use my credit card, it would get rejected because it's like, well, you're not in Germany. Why are you using your credit card in Germany? So therefore it must be a problem. Well, no, I got on an airplane and I flew to Germany. So now it's starting to use more intelligence Things like, well, I can't at two o'clock in the afternoon be in, you know, Dallas, Texas, and then at three o'clock in the afternoon be in Germany. I can't travel to Germany in an hour. So if I show up using my credit card in Dallas and then I show up an hour later using my credit card in Germany, that's impossible. So that might be triggered as some kind of a fraud. So trying to learn what is normal and predict if something's outside of normal. And so another term that you'll hear for this is something called anomaly detection. Anomaly detection. And anomaly detection is a area that's under a lot of research right now where we're trying to determine what's not normal. And if it's not normal, how can we take actions to make it better? Network planning and engineering, that's one of my favorites. Um, within the network planning and engineering space, uh, just how can we better um, plan our cell sites? How can we make sure we have enough traffic um, support? How can we make sure we're meeting subscribers' needs? And then a question came up with respect to SON. This is a little bit different. This is orchestration, but what this is trying to focus on is can I do things like add artificial intelligence to various portions of my network so that it can more intelligently make decisions? So instead of me as a human being saying, hey, I want to deploy some more capacity somewhere, maybe that can be determined by some type of an artificial intelligence algorithm. Okay. We've talked about AI use cases in general. Natural language processing, image recognition. We talked a bit about AI use cases directly in telecom space. Network planning and engineering, security, fraud, workforce uh, management and such. I wanna shift gears a little bit and I wanna talk about a couple of more use cases. Um, and I refer to these as telecom impacting use cases. So when I talk about a telecom in, in, impacting use case, what I want you to think about is I want you to think about, I've got my, my telecom network, and I'm trying to provide some type of a service that has an AI component to it that's going to run on top of my network. So let me give you a couple of examples. Autonomous driving is becoming a bigger and bigger thing. Today, when people are designing their autonomous driving systems, they aren't sharing data or they're not sharing much data with other vehicles, with, with other entities. There are some proposals of how to do this, but in the longer term, what we're looking at is if we can start to share information 
we can make the autonomous vehicles much, much safer. There's an interesting discussion in that infographic of, of can AI think ethically uh, that talk a bit about autonomous driving. But autonomous driving is something that's going to have a lot of information that needs to be shared, and the telecom network might support that. There's some different opinions of that. Um, right now, whenever we talk about any type of an AI algorithm that's or an autonomous driving system, we are talking about things that don't rely on any type of a communication mechanism to make any type of a decision. It's based off its own sensors um, alone. This will just make it better. Let me give you kind of my favorite example is driving on the highway, five miles up the road, there's a wreck. Well, what would be really nice is if I knew there was a wreck five miles up the road so that I could slow down and avoid any type of, a, of a, um, you know, adding to the problem. That's where that communication might come in. Another example that we hear a lot is IoT. And the reason IoT and AI go so well together is Internet of Things, there's a lot of things, right? There are different um, estimates out there, but we, we start to get estimates of billions of devices. Well, every one of those devices is going to have data that needs to be communicated. So if I have all of this data, I need some type of an AI model to process that data so that we can um, take action. I mean, I mean, think about this a little bit. And I work with the, the lady that's the head of our IT department here towards solutions quite often. And she and I have this conversation a lot. With all of the different systems we have, we have a lot of data. And she's like, well, how do I know what's valuable data? That's where an AI model can come in. If all it does is to take all of this, you know, um, terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data and convert it into good, bad, because that's really all she cares about. And if you think about it, you're the same way, right? If you're trying to manage a lot of different things, all you really care about is it going well or is it not going well? Now, if it's not going well, you want to get to the next layer of detail. But that's something that AI can help us with. It can help try to, to, to take all of that massive amount of data and kind of whittle it down to useful information that I can take actions upon. One more example that I have is um, extended reality. And we talk about extended reality. XR is a generic term for augmented reality, mixed reality, and virtual reality. And what this is trying to do is it's trying to uh, do some type of an enhancement so that we can um, create a game or do some type of, of overlay of information onto a camera image or what have you. Now, the reason we associate this with artificial intelligence is decisions have to be made very, very quickly. If I'm in the virtual reality space, I've got something called a photon, let's see what I'm, uh, a photon, a motion to photon delay motion to photon delay. And this is what this is saying is if I've got a headset on, if I move my move my head, the image needs to move with me. If I don't, then I'll get what's referred to as VR sickness. I'll physically get sick. This motion to photon delay is less than 20 milliseconds. When I'm dealing with something like augmented reality and mixed reality, I've got a delay of less than 10 milliseconds. And the reason I've got such a low delay is because the image is moving, right? If you think about it, I've got a camera, I'm pointing it down the street, and it's showing me where all the coffee shops are. If I move my image, the little flags to where the coffee shops needs to move as well. So extended reality is another one of those enhancing technologies that are going to um, help us provide some type of service. 
the telecom network may be the network that's providing that. If you're interested in this field, I've got one more article that I want to um, put it over here. So there is a Chinese company by the name of Badu, and they gave a presentation at the um, the GPU Technology Conference, um, which is a big uh, conference in California that talks about AI, and uh, what this article talks a bit about is this architecture where you're able to put um, artificial intelligence into the telecom network to speed up processing and to provide this service. Um, so they're, they've done some interesting stuff. I've seen some demos that they've had. Um, so interesting article for that. All right. Fantastic. Well, we're starting to run out of time, so let me open things up for any uh, last questions. You ask the questions, I'll see if I can come up with the answers. Jump in the chat, jump in the Q&A, whichever is easiest for you. How is AI doing in telecom at present in the United States? It's a great question, Raj, and um, it's in its infancy. What you're going to see within the telecom space, um, and I have more experience in the United States versus uh, other countries, United States and Canada, is you see some very, very small examples. You don't see great examples. You don't see a lot of, uh, of use, and typically they're in a very isolated case. So maybe I'm using it to do some type of a traffic analysis. Maybe maybe it's something that a vendor has built into a piece of equipment. And so it's using it to make better decisions over the air interface. So it's still very, very early uh, in uh, its use within the United States. I think within other industries, artificial intelligence has um, a bit more prominence than in the telecom space. But I do think that it's gonna be a, um, a very big area within the telecom space. I think as we start talking about trying to manage our network as we have more and more uh, devices, artificial intelligence is gonna become um, a requirement, not just a nice to have. Um, Question from SS. Do you have any idea about, uh, about uh, Rakuten uh, Japan using AI for 5G networks? I don't. Um, I saw something about that, and my only guess is uh, they're using it potentially to help them pick locations. They might help it as part of SON, like we talked about before. So um, I'm not, I don't have a lot of information on, on Rakuten. Sorry about that, SS. Um, are we expecting in, uh, advanced AI in root cause analysis in telecom operations? Uh, absolutely, yes. So we're starting to see more and more examples of people trying to take data using artificial intelligence to learn how to do more of a root cause analysis. Now, there's a couple of ways in which people can approach that. But, but yeah, absolutely, that's something that people are interested in doing in the short term. So we have kind of three levels. We have kind of a, um, a descriptive level, um, a, a problem um, happened in the past and we can use artificial intelligence to determine why it happened, what it was. We have a prescriptive saying, we expect a problem to occur in the future do something and then we have something called predictive which is saying or, or um, i'm sorry predictive is predicting something in the future prescriptive is saying hey you're about to have a problem here's the potential solution so yeah absolutely how ai interact with different country laws like privacy um ss that is a fantastic question 
unfortunately, we're still very, very early in the legal um, use of AI. Every country is going to have different laws with respect to artificial intelligence. Uh, we saw um, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, within the United States and then a day or two either before or after within the United Kingdom, there were having uh, government meetings to describe or to at least start to, 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 to plan out what laws they were going to have with respect to artificial intelligence. Now, I think what we're going to see is not so much artificial intelligence laws as much as it's going to be technology related laws. So, for example, um, if I'm having some type of technology that's doing, let's say, face recognition. Well, face recognition may be outlawed or face recognition may be reg regulated. Uh, the state of California, I think it is, uh, was it Cal I think it was California has outlawed facial recognition in the state of California. Um, so that's not so much an AI law as a face recognition privacy law, but AI was the key technology that made that um, facial recognition concept work. So I'm thinking that we're going to start to see laws related around that. Um, I think we're going to see laws related about, um, yeah, like you're saying, more uh, worried about accessing location for network optimization. So there will be privacy related things that we'll probably see. We're already see seeing some of that. We see a lot of companies, I was at a presentation that AT&T uh, here in the United States gave uh, here in Dallas a few weeks ago. And they made a big thing saying, if you do any type of AI algorithm, you have to justify why you're using specific pieces of data. And they were really getting at the privacy piece that you, you're talking about SS. So absolutely, I agree with you 100%. But again, in my opinion, what I think we're going to see is a law about privacy, not so much a law about AI. So we, we, I want to separate that at AI. I want to I want to consider AI a tool in the toolbox. And so it's not an AI problem. It's a technology to do whatever. All right. Another big example is the deep fakes. And deep fakes are being used for a number of different things. But one of the biggest and in that uh, infographic article I sent you, it talks a little bit about that. Um, Barack Obama was someone did a deep fake of him giving some speech well that needs to be illegal right you can't have somebody create a false presentation by somebody else though ai is the tool that makes that happen it's the use it's that that deep fake use that's really the problem in my mind all right guys thank you guys so much i'm going to put in the chat my email address series at awardsolutions.com. Um, one last reminder, uh, our discount on some additional training, um, welcome to AI and our technology primer, artificial intelligence scheduled for September 11th and October 14th. If you want me to send you the link to this, so you don't have to write down all of the, the letters uh, connect with me in LinkedIn. Thank you guys so very much for uh, giving me your time here today. We'll be doing a, another webinar in a month, the second Tuesday of August on automation use cases. And then we'll be back in September talking about artificial intelligence. So, um, if you guys have any questions, please reach out to me. Otherwise, thank you so much, and until next time, have a great day.